morning. It's so nice to see all of you. Because I keep forgetting every Sunday, because that's just the way my mind works, I'd like to invite uh, Angel Shopper up front. We, um, she's joined our church. So in addition to uh, Marley and Ernie, who joined us last year, Angel has decided to join us. And as you know, she's already a family. So um, we're just very happy that uh, she's made that decision. Do you guys know, all know her? <laughs> as far as uh, I knew her, she's the wife of the famous uh, dark ball player that we have on our team. <laughs> Jimmy, wave your hand back there. He's the one who has the highest average in the whole dark ball league. And, uh, and I got to know Angel through some family get-togethers. And they've even uh, had Sophie over, our, our, over their house one time when I when Lisa was uh, watching Sophie for us when we went to Florida uh, a couple years ago. So, uh, Diane wants to take a picture, and she usually does. <laughs> Good. We're so happy to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have a few other uh, people that we're adding to the prayer list this week. Um, Connie Zimmerman was added. Deb Enterline was mentioned last week. Kay Whitmer is having surgery on her knee. And we're praying for a little baby named William Michael Ray Wagner, who's uh, in the NICU at Harrisburg Hospital. And he belongs to the Stern Road family. So please pray for little William Michael Ray. Any other people that you want to add? Any updates that you have? How many of you got your newsletter? Is, and if you don't get a newsletter mailed to you and you would like to have a paper copy, please let me know. Uh, if you're on our emailing list, you should have gotten an email version of it. But if you would like a paper copy, just let me know, please. Jan. Uh, with the Messiah Okay, yeah, every Sunday there's two emails, usually one from Jan from Christian Education and one from Sally Ann, which is the newsletter and the bulletins every week. And then everything is on the website as well for HalifaxMessiah.Church. Pastor, since I mentioned last week my dad had his gallbladder out this past week, he's doing great. I recommend it, get that thing out of there, like all that. <laughs> so we can take him off the prayer list. Okay. And there's no choir at the church today, if you'll stay. I have some good tricks up my sleeve, and I'm pretty interested to see how it can work out. Oh, good. Okay, so adult choir after church today. Beth, would you like to do birthdays and anniversaries, please? Okay, birthdays for this week are Dave Miller. Happy birthday, Dave. Toby, Toby Huffman, Daniel Schmink, Jameson Jewelry. Happy birthday. Marie Ashbury, happy birthday. Zachary Stoneman and Douglas Schwartz and anniversaries are Tom and V. Like Healer. Oh, awesome. All right, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Thank you. 
remembrance of your baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who writes the law upon our hearts so that all people will care for one another. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and each other. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in any of our sin and cannot break ourselves free. We pour things for ourselves on the day of sorrow. We see the ways that silence others or remain silent when we should speak up. We keep it sore in our hearts and hurt her or her children. But these things do not hurt us. In a flood of grace and out of love for the whole world, God comes near to break every snare of sin, to wash away our wrongs and restore the promise of life through His Son, Jesus Christ. It is by His authority that I make this declaration. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, accept release from guilt and be free from threat or punishment for your every sin. Amen.
us to live faithfully and to act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit as one God, now and forever. Amen. morning comes from Exodus chapter 20. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six, day, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Your, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Parents are first reading. Please join me in reciting Psalm 19 together responsibly by verse. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day God is together with another, and one mind imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the arrows of the edge of the heavens, and runs about to the end of the Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just the fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More than the desire of the naked gold, more than the shining gold, sweeter far than money, than money even down. By them also is your servant enlightened. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse thee from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart is acceptable in your sight. taken from 1 Corinthians, beginning, uh, or the second reading is taken from 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, beginning in the 18th verse. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, 
I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will for. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Here is the reading.
The priests had a task of instructing the Israelites how to not cause defilement and to purge the sanctuary whenever defilement occurred. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Ethical elements fuse with and inform rituals so that there's a moral basis to every ritual act. So there is a connection to the Ten Commandments. There is a moral basis for the behavior that God expects from us. Reasons that people are instructed to either act or refrain from acting. So what Jesus did kind of makes sense. He was demonstrating that he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law and prophecy. He is the great high priest who is visibly and tangibly connecting ancient Hebrew laws of purity and righteousness to God's living word and decisive action. It's no coincidence that once God brought his children out of the house of slavery, he didn't want them becoming slaves again to anyone or anything in the temple, which was God's house on earth. You see, the priests had responsibility for the welfare of all Israel, and they oversaw every aspect of daily life, especially animal sacrifice, so that if it was performed as prescribed, the person bringing the animal would dutifully handle the animal in such a way that when the priest took over the ritual of the altar, sacred purity would have been maintained during the exchange of hands because it was being presented to Almighty God. Are you starting to see why Jesus was upset by what he witnessed? All right, let's see how this goes into time with the gospel. The study Bible goes on to say that according to the holiness code, there was such a thing, spatial holiness was not limited to the interior of the sanctuary. It applied to all of the promised land. And the holiness of persons was not limited to priests, but extended to all. All of the land was holy. Therefore, those who reside on it were to keep it that way by observing God's commandments. Violations of the covenant between God and people could happen inside the sanctuary or outside of it. And they must be confessed and addressed through either ritual purification or expulsion. That's what Jesus did. Things are actually starting to make sense now, right? When Jesus' disciples remembered Psalm 69.9, which reads, it is, for, it is zeal for your house that has consumed me. The second part of that verse says, The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. This makes sense too. It seems to suggest that Jesus experiences the insult himself since God is the one who is the ultimate object of insult. In this case, the insult amounts to defiling the temple and God's people by polluting religious observance with a mercenary practice. Again, the Jews wonder by what authority Jesus acts. They ask this question almost every week, right? And Jesus answers, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And this is where Jesus co-signs the Ten Commandments. By declaring there is one temple, just one, which is my body. This is the one and only place that houses God. He deserves to be worshipped rather than a place. He's the object of devotion and dedication rather than the form of any other thing in heaven above, on earth below, or in the water under the earth. To no temple or statue should you bow down or worship, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Holiness is important. Keep my name holy along with the Sabbath. Then the Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. Will you raise it up in three days? And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and every word that Jesus spoke. The Apostle Paul says it best. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those being saved, it is the power of God. 
While Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, we proclaim Christ crucified. To those who are called, Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. And God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Every gospel lesson boils down to a matter of trust. Will we trust in the means, the persons, the objects that we do business with, and the people that we engage in trade, or will we trust in the very source of life, the one person to whom we owe our freedom, to whom we owe, to whom we ought to devote our time, our energy, our resources, and religious practice? I began by asking whether Jesus' message for us might be, don't make religion a commodity. Don't let loyalty to God become an industry or make the wares of worship something to be treated. At this point, I might add, don't make religion a bargaining chip in politics. Don't let loyalty be to God become zeal to protect business interests. Don't allow the wares of worship to be treated for gain. It seems as though we do worship more than God alone. For one thing, we worship freedom rather than the one who sets us free. Rather than accept being dependent upon God alone, we worship our independence, which is sometimes considered self-rule or self-determination. The point of Moses delivering the Ten Commandments was to give us a set of rules and to guide us into a way of living so that according to the commentary from Sundays and Seasons, life and community would flourish as it will when based on honesty, trust, fidelity, respect for life, family, and property. So there we have at least some insight a better understanding of what Jesus was about on the outskirts of the temple, what God was about on the top of Mount Sinai, and what we might be about going forward as we leave this place. The psalmist wrote, The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. Commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. If we order the phrases a bit differently, they say this that the Lord's teaching, testimony, and commandments are perfect and sure, clear, and just. They revive the soul, they give wisdom to the simple, rejoice the heart, and light to the eyes. Does any of that sound bad? What the psalmist declares is really true. It's in our best interest to listen and learn from what we are told. The gospel or good news is this. In the form of Jesus Christ, God not only delivered and restated his word and purpose in person, he demonstrated how consistently God values the separation between holiness and profanity. We usually only think of profanity as bad language, but in fact the word refers to anything that's irreverent or disrespectful. The psalmist went on to say that keeping God's commandments ought to be desired. Why? Because by doing so we will become enlightened and obtain a great reward. Oh, this is probably where people get the idea that doing the right thing leads to being rewarded, spared from sickness and death. Every week I have at least one patient tell me that they don't understand why God has allowed them or a family member to become so ill. Their reasoning goes like this. I've always tried to do the right thing. Why is this happening to me? Or I've made the effort to treat people well through my entire life, and now this... I don't know how to trust God anymore. I, too, went through something similar at the age of 25 when my mom died. She was a devout Christian woman, and so was I. 
We had a very close relationship and were deeply bonded emotionally. In fact, she'd been my very best friend, friend throughout my entire life. And I deeply believed that God knew the deepest longings of my heart and understood what her loss would mean to me. But God took her anyway. I didn't know how to trust God. What it felt like to lose my mom. Today's readings make us wonder, how is it possible to become whole and sound after experiencing brokenness? How can fear that is related to God's awesome power over our lives and our bodies, or fear that's related to suffering and judgment, be overcome? How can losing our health or the presence of a loved one be reconciled to a God who claims to be trustworthy, but does not exempt us from bad circumstances or worse? To start with, we must decide who God is. Is God a heavenly scorekeeper who sits way up high in a box overhanging the earth like it's some marked playing field? Are the commandments lines spray painted on grass drawn with chalk or painted on hardwood surfaces? Is God someone with a pen and a book who notes every player's jersey number and then makes hash marks for roll points? personal, or team fouls? Is God the kind of coach who only plays players who make it look good? Who rewards only those who are on the first string, who score by doing everything as told, making every play count, making our families proud? On some level, we all think that way. So let us pray. In some ways, Lord, the commandments seem like speed limits and speedometers. They're useful in detecting our tendency to push boundaries. They let us know when we risk going out of bounds, foolishly endanger our own lives or the safety of others around us. Lord, we ask you to be our wisdom and strength under all circumstances and to let your word dwell in our hearts and our mouths as we dearly desire to be acceptable in your sight. As you gaze upon our weakness, we give thanks that you always see us through the precious light of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the pure, the Holy One, our greatest reward and our only source of redemption. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
faith all morning. We're going to go to the prayers and intercession. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things. Let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and the world in need. You alone are God. We thank you today for the gift of Sabbath rest and the means of grace given through your holy word and the Eucharistic meal. meal. Awaken the church to other ministries, mysteries surrounding your presence. Give us glad hearts as we receive the good news of deliverance from sin. That the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable. O Lord, our strength and redeemer. You renew creation. Drive out those who would make the earth a marketplace. Protect rainforests, mountaintops, oceans, and wilderness areas from commercial exploitation. Unite nations, policymakers, and businesses in efforts to reduce pollution. That the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable. O Lord, our strength and redeemer. You judge the nations. We pray for an end to war and strife in every land. Strengthen international efforts to negotiate peace and provide humanitarian aid to people fleeing from conflict. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable. O Lord, our strength and redeemer. You bring healing and hope. We give thanks for physicians, nurses, researchers, therapists, and public health workers who prevent and treat illness. We pray for any who are sick, especially those in our prayer list, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable. O Lord, our strength and redeemer. You abide with your people. Sustain any in this community undergoing life transitions, marriage, divorce, childbirth, adoption, moving, graduation, employment change, or death in the family. That the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable. O oh Lord, strengthen your name. You bring life from death. We remember loved ones who have died, confident that they have a new life in you. May we trust that nothing can separate us from your love. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable. O oh Lord, our strength and redeemer. O oh Lord, you are our strength and redeemer. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be acceptable through your Son, Jesus Christ, who does all things to restore what is right, proper, good, and for our good. In your holy name we pray. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other a sign of God's peace.
grape juice in here for every child. So I'm going to ask the children to just receive bread today and then let the grape juice be for those who can't have wine, if you don't mind. All right. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord, Lord our God, God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you.
stand as you're able. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.
that we're not going to have adult choir after church today. Is there anything else, Brenda? No. Okay. All right, thank you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.